Good morning and welcome to the fourth webinar of Nick's Leadership Huddle Series. This morning's panel of industry leaders will speak to Confronting the New Normal, a conversation between operators, lenders, and private equity providers during a pandemic. I'm Chuck Harry, Nick's Chief Operating Officer, and I'll be facilitating incoming questions for this morning's panelists. Before we begin our discussion, let's review the webinar's technology logistics. You have joined the webinar using either your computer's speaker system or your telephone based on your audio access during your most recent GoToWebinar session. You can adjust your audio access to this morning's webinar through either your computer speakers or your telephone using the settings in the audio pane, which is located at the top of the control panel on the right side of your computer screen. We welcome your questions for our panelists during today's webinar. To submit a question, type your question into the questions panel located within the same control panel on the right side of your computer screen. You may submit questions at any time during the webinar and select incoming questions will be answered following the panelists' discussion. For those questions not answered during the webinar, we will strive to follow up with individual responses following the conclusion of the webinar. For those of you on Twitter, our hashtag for this webinar is hashtag Nick Leadership Huddle. Now that we've addressed the webinar technology logistics, please welcome my associate Beth Mace, who will introduce this morning's speakers and begin our discussion. Thanks, Chuck. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nick's fourth Leadership Huddle. Uh, as Chuck said, my name is Beth Mace, and I'm the Chief Economist at Nick, and we welcome you. As many, as, you know, as many of you know, we've been holding these webinars every two weeks to help keep us all informed about the pandemic and its effects on the seniors housing and skilled nursing sectors. Things have changed and changed significantly since our first webinar as we have moved into what's become our new normal. Today's webinar will provide insights into some of these changes. Before I introduce our panelists though, I would like to once again iterate that Nick continues to be concerned about the care and safety of seniors across the nation, both those inside congregate settings and those outside. We know that seniors are particularly susceptible to the coronavirus and the threat is not over. We extend our deepest regard and respect for those taking care of America's seniors with care, love, and commitment. They are among the heroes in these very difficult times. At this time, many caregivers still do not have the equipment and support they need. Nick continues to support all efforts to provide the much needed PPE and effective testing that is needed until that time when a vaccine can be found and provided to all. It is only by prioritizing these frontline healthcare workers needs that we'll be able to keep seniors safe and healthy. This in turn will prevent them from needing to go to hospitals and thereby help flatten the curve. Now, let me start with you, John. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. And uh, John Moore, um, it, it says I'm the chairman, chief executive officer. I think it says founder, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's where that came from. But anyway, I'm the CEO of Atria Senior Living. We uh, manage about 220 buildings across the United States um, and Canada. And my proudest accomplishment was being uh, the only one and a half term um, chairman of, uh, of Nick. Chris, can you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, Beth. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Taylor. I'm part of the healthcare real estate team at Capital One. Capital One and its predecessors have been providing debt capital to the long-term care and senior housing space for over 20 years now. We currently have balance sheet commitments of a little over $3 billion, and we've also been one of the leading Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac originators over the past two or three years. Great, thanks so much. And uh, Steve, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Blazewski. I'm a managing director and the senior portfolio manager for the senior housing funds at PGM, uh, an affiliate of Prudential Financial. Uh, between our various funds, we manage somewhere around 1.6 billion of total equity to be invested or invested in senior housing. Uh, leverage that's closer to, you know, four and a half billion of total buying power. At any one time we'll own, with, uh, typically in conjunction with our partners, our operators, somewhere between 30 and 50 different communities located throughout the U.S., primarily focused on independent living, 
assisted living and memory care. And we typically don't go into skilled nursing or active adult, although we do look at those sectors as well. Great, thank you. And Nikki, can we go to the next slide, please? So as many of you know, uh, NIC has been conducting weekly surveys among executives of um, operating companies to get a, a sense of what the pulse is going on in the properties in terms of occupancy rates, in terms of move-ins, move-outs, um, what they're doing, what operators are doing for their staff, and where development uh, stands. And uh, we've just completed, completed, excuse me, wave five of the executive survey, and this is an indication of some of the results. And this question is looking at the change in occupancy by care segment, care segments being defined as either independent living, assisted living, memory care, or nursing care. And you can see on the top right, 79% of the nursing care, um, of those respondents having nursing care units, we, we, well, let me start again, to reported that there was a, a decline in the occupancy rate uh, from the prior month. This compares to memory care, which ranked number two at 70%, followed by assisted living and independent living. Uh, very few are reporting uh, increases in occupancy rates, as you can see, but there are still about a third of those in independent living reporting no um, change in the occupancy rates. The next slide shows um, how this has changed over time. So as I said, we've had five waves, um, and this is looking at the differences in occupancy patterns from the first, second wave to the fifth wave. And on the far right, if you can start, you can see for nursing care, again, about 79% of those uh, respondents with nursing care units are reporting a decline in occupancy rates. A little bit less than what we saw in the last survey week, but generally about the same, about 80%. And then as you move from right to left, for memory care, you can see it was 70% in wave four, a slight acceleration from last week. Um, in assisted living, it's about 69%, and in independent living, about 54%. So if you want more information about this in great detail, please go to our website, www.nic.org. And you can see at the very top, there's a special location for COVID-19 resource centers. And you can see these results and a lot of the other information that Nick is providing during the COVID uh, pandemic. And with that, um, John, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, because um, I know your team has done a lot of work and analysis on the spread and the incidence and severity of COVID-19 across the U.S. and especially in New York. So can you share some of the findings that you guys have done? Sure. Um, it, it, you know, in order Next to try slide. to... Up, yeah. Sorry. Next slide. KK, Wolf, and Jay is uh, me and three other guys. We, we just thought we'd have a little fun at that. Um, but we've spent, and we, and we spent enough time together to, to think that uh, that's all we're doing. But you go to the next slide. So, so we've been spending a lot of time um, trying to try to make sure we understand the data and um, that impacts you know everything from where we preposition PPE to uh, protocols um, you know to you know now where we're looking and, and how we open up and, and, uh, and how we're smart about it and just you know a handful of observations that we we saw early um, you know the, the reality is with this disease it's New York City and it's and mostly in suburbs and everywhere else. Um, the the this is a this slide shows the um, case uh, total cases per uh, thousand people in population. You know, one of the things when you see data and we were seeing it too, you know, the news jumps to absolute numbers and and that can tell a story that may or may not be the the one you need to pay attention to. But when you look at it, <coughs> um, New York metro area. 21.3 per thousand, um, you know, and then if you looked at Westchester County alone, it's 31 uh, per thousand. So to put that in context, the rest of the U.S., if you exclude the New York New York Metro, is running about 2.8 per thousand, and that's largely driven by New England and uh, and uh, sort of sort of Pennsylvania. Um, if you look at other places like California. Uh, even Seattle, um, you, you know, where we're, we're it hit early, the penetration numbers are lower. Um, and then just to give it more context, if you compare it to Italy, um, you, you know, and particularly, and if you then break Italy out into the regions, um, Lombardy, the region, uh, Cremona, um, the, the specific location that was hardest hit in, in Italy, um, it it's, it's, doesn't really compare to um, the New York suburbs. 
and and since you know we do a lot of business in the New York suburbs, uh, you know this is this has been important for us to follow. So if you, the next slide, it's going to go through a handful of slides that take you through this. This is the kind of slide you know this this uh, graph something very similar to this, and and we're taking data from lots of sources from of course Johns Hopkins, the ones everybody knows about, uh, but there's also a ton of of people out there sort of voluntarily aggregating and and combing through the the, the state data releases so there is a lot of information out there that, that you can that you can that you can you can see but this is a slide that um, just is in absolute numbers and that's typically what you're seeing out there so new york is the green uh, line the rest of the united states is the blue line and the headline early this week was uh, new york going down but the rest of the u.s uh, not so much um, and 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 it was from looking at at data like this. Interestingly, and I'll point out just to the the relative uh, situation, the, the 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 sort of call out um, where it's blown up on the right. That's the Bay Area. So the Bay Area on this graph in absolute numbers is statistically zero. Yeah, and 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 but but if you if you blow it up, it does it does look like a graph that's trying to go, trying to go down. Um, next slide. Um, now this is putting it in terms of, of per capita numbers, and you can see it is basically the New York City metro and everything else. And you can see while um, the U.S. is stubbornly holding on near its peak, it's uh, you know it is actually not going up, and this is a disease that spreads. So it's a combination of a handful of situations where there's outbreaks. Um, and, and a lot of situations where it's stabilizing going, going down. And on the right, just to give context, that's the, that's the change in uh, growth um, over the last handful of days. So it's, it's kind of one step, you know, two steps forward, two steps back. Um, but, you know, you, you can see in the context of everything, um, you know, it, Italy overall, the, the Italian region, you can see the case penetration um, in New York being so much more dramatic than anywhere else. Next slide. Similar graph. This is the the you know the end result of all of this, and, and worrying about deaths is is uh, you know what you worry about with with disease. Um, you can see that the peak in New York seems to be clear, and it's more clear that there may be a peak in the in the in the rest of the U.S. in, in terms of deaths. Um, next slide. And um, again, when you look at it per capita. Um, uh, you can see the peak in New York, uh, but you can also see the rest of the U.S. is, um, while it's not necessarily falling from the high point, it doesn't seem to, it's not growing either. And in the context of, of everything else, um, you know, the rest of the U.S. compares favorably or is very similar to the rest of, uh, you know, the rest of Italy, for, for example, as a, as a country that um, had a, a big outbreak per capita. Next slide. So this is something that we've looked at uh, from the beginning. So this is just simply daily, the blue bars are daily tests, the green bars are daily negatives, the red bars are daily positives, and the yellow bars are um, pending tests daily. And then the graph at the top is cumulative positive results as a percentage of cumulative tests. And so, you know, one of the things that um, we watch is you know what is the cumulative testing ratio doing, and it is you know definitely trending down. This is the U.S. without New York and California. California is excluded because its data tends to be very um, lumpy and it's released in chunks, so it's it's not it's not not been great for analysis. Um, you can also see that while testing um, started to go up end of April, it's so far it's actually not accelerating you know that much. It sort of Testing sort of went up in steps um, in a chunk early April, you know, in, in the end of April, and we're kind of running if you if you level that at the same level that we have for for two weeks or so. Um, and here's the the really interesting uh, part. The next slide um, is at the New York City metro, um, just the New York part because the data is easier to get in New York than it is. In New Jersey and Connecticut, um, so New York City, Westchester, and Long Island, same thing. If you recall, the testing ratio um, for the for the whole country, X New York, 
uh, you, you know, peaked at about 16%, meaning 16% of the people tested were positive. In New York, it was running at 46%. Its high daily peak was 56%. Um, and, and so, it, you know, the, the disease penetration by all counts, um, you know, much greater in New York. Similarly, the disease decay seems to be much more obvious here as well. Um, your, your, the, the cumulative uh, testing ratio down to 35%. Um, and then daily, um, we, we, the last um, day that we, we could look at it, the, the number of uh, people, the percentage of people that tested positive out of the tests that compared to the tests done that day was 11%. On this graph, that didn't happen until early March. Uh, it, it, it ha that hasn't happened since early March. So you can see a, a pretty, a, a clear indication of, of, of uh, you know, of disease decay disease exposure pay in New York, decay in New York. And you can also see that the testing, the blue bars are testing. You can also see the testing really has an increase. So it's not driven by more testing. It's driven by less people being, 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 uh, coming out positive when being tested. Um, so that's kind of the set of stuff that we've looked at, um, you know, and we look at it every day. We update this every day. It, it, it impacts um, our decisions. If you, if you look at the next slide, um you know and, and on to the next slide um, and the next slide so this is a, you can go get this off our website um but this is a letter sort of report that we made for um you know we we, we addressed it to the atri extended family so for for uh, residents their families um uh, you know in, investors absolutely for our staff just talking about you know what we've done as things moved on, and if you go to the next slide, um, so you know, John, some I, of the, I, let me interrupt you for a second. Let me just uh, so on the on this slide that you're showing, this is showing some of the metrics that you've been measuring at Atria in terms of um, some of the challenges that you've been facing and how you've been addressing it in terms of operations and employee support. So can you highlight a couple of these numbers because these are really interesting. I think a uh, sure. real hands-on evidence of what's going on. Sure. I mean, it's um, yeah. I, I lost count of the the individual pieces of the PPE, but I mean, one of the things that I mean, I think we got sort of right, and we started buying PPE early. Um, we have a um, a kitchen supply vendor here in Louisville that happens to have a warehouse and is kind of out of business, so we've taken over their warehouse, um, and and you know, we bought uh, you know masks, gowns gloves in early you know buying buying in the millions um you, you know you can see on the left the top left is our warehouse and you know we we centralize pp ship ship from here um the 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 second picture on the left is in fact a air freighter um that we hired uh, early on in march when we had a uh, first outbreak in uh, in northern california um, some of the other th the the next picture is our own brand of hand sanitizer hand hand, sanit hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. uh, we know a guy who knows a guy who has a still, mm -hmm. and we made five million gallons of hand sanitizer. Um, you know, we've we've also uh, the bottom is I think that's the foaming uh, hand soap, and you know we've made a ton of that as well. Um, you know, the other thing we've done, you know, anytime a a community gets affected by COVID. Well, there there are ED letters that are form letters that are created and information put in here for EDs to be able to send letters to residents and families every day, especially if a COVID-19 case occurs or anything happens with respect to COVID-19. So, um, you know, tracking, you know, there are literally hundreds of thousands of those uh, communications, uh, you know, that have happened. Uh, you know, one, one of the things, Sylvia, the next slide, if you, if you, uh, you know, I talked about New York, um, you know, and you can see one of our, a slide from one of our daily reports um, in New York, you know, one of the things that we did early is went to heavier PPE in New York, um, all N95 masks. Um, we had our staff have N95 masks and gloves that they could commute in, um, you know, by, you know, I think it was March 20th or so. And then by the end of March, we were sending masks to, to our staff in, in uh, New York area. We were sending 
uh, you know, masks for them to take home for their family members. One of the hardest things to do, and we're at the phase where that is, you know, this is one of the biggest things we're fighting is we've all defended residents well uh, from a quarantine, but you know, how do you make sure your staff are protected as they commute and they're and they're out and they're out in the they're out in the in, in the world? So, you know, putting them, giving them PP that they can use um, when they're not in the building was was something that we did in New York. We also went to scrubs in New York. We also because we wanted staff to be able to come in change into a clean set of scrubs, work all day, change back in their in their clothes, um, scrubs, shoes. We we bought shoes for everybody in New York, you know, as 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 well. Um, so so, so John, that, that's that's really informative. And I think people should know that they can go to the website, your website to see more of this. And you even you have a timeline to track yes, the activities that, that you're seeing. Um, I want to yes, bring in some of our other panelists for a minute, though, and ask so uh, starting with you, Steve, what are some of the questions that you're um, entertaining with your operating partners in terms of, you know, John just gave us a good sense of what they're doing in Atria. What are you what are you hearing in terms of operations? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Beth. I think, um, first of all, I would say that we, we absolutely as an investor and as an owner, we feel a little bit of a helplessness sense. I think it's important to note, you know, our role is really in support of operators like John and, and people really more on the front line. So for the first couple of weeks of this, really in, in mid-March, I think our focus was on communication, particularly with our operating partners. Um, frankly, in many cases, trying to make sure they're prepared for what we thought would happen. Uh, we do work with many smaller regional type operators, probably not as well capitalized and, and maybe as forth, uh, you know, or as uh, front thinking as, as John and Atria might be. And so we spent a lot of time really talking about their procedures, their protocols, and what happens when they do get a positive uh, COVID-19 case there. So I think sometimes it's asking the right questions. Uh, as we got past that, then we started really getting into some of the data and, and communication. And so keep in mind, we're communicating with our operating partners, but also with our investors who are also our clients. So we really have you know, clients on both sides. And I think communication has really been a huge uh, factor. And I think operators have learned a lot about communication and, and how to communicate with their family members and their residents as well. And we've had that same learning experience with our partners. As we got further in, we started to see the impact and we really started to think more about uh, the employees at, at communities. And so reached out to some of them as well, some of our key partners, and, and really started thinking about how we can support the, the frontline workers. So whether it was through personal initiatives like sending care packages or uh, supporting hourly wage increases, which I'm sure most of our operators have felt. Uh, we've also talked about other things like providing some of the PPE equipment that John talked about, providing you know, food banks in some cases. So I think our, our role really has been one of support for the operators and then communication really the other way to our clients. Uh, those have really been the key focus areas and it's, it has evolved a lot over the last six to eight weeks. And you know, I think now we're getting to a point in this where I think John and other and their op the operators are really starting to feel a sense of fatigue. As the longer this goes on, I think you know you're getting employees back and you're learning protocols and getting systems in place. But I think it, it starts to wear on people, and I think we're going to shift to a different mode, and we're going to have to learn how to support people differently. Uh, Chris, any thoughts in terms of the conversations that you're having with as you know you're a lender to a lot of uh, senior housing operators? What are some of the conversations that you're having? I think it's very similar to Steve Beth in that. You know, we do feel a little bit powerless. We are communication, as Steve said, is really important. We're trying to gather as much information as we can, not only for our own benefit, but to share with others. I, I think I've been looking, and what John laid out here is is a great example. I think we've been really, really impressed with the operators and the way they have responded to this. I think that by and large, they were pretty well prepared, not necessarily for this specific situation, but you know, they dealt with bad flu is not, not the COVID, it's the flu. I'm not, I don't want to get into that argument, but I mean, they have really responded and it, it really reminds me of why we are active in this space. You know, we, we put the residents in their care and service first. We've also tried to be very respectful of, you know, our customers have other priorities besides just responding to lender questions. So we've tried to balance communicating with them and gathering information with all, also respecting their time. Right, that's really important these days because everyone's really busy. And and John, back to you for a minute. In terms of when I mean, you're the operator, what are what are you hearing other questions and what Steve and Chris indicated, or how are you responding to your partners? I mean, obviously so, you've done all this great work here. So that data is part of a daily report. So I've I've written a daily report since I think uh, March 3rd yeah, that goes out to 
the the you know the board and all of our investors and all and all our friends the communication with um, our biggest partners i mean it, it's can't tell you how supportive both you know Ventos and Healthbeak and CSH and everyone and and uh, formation and all the people we work with um have been and you know how how helpful uh, you know they've been in just helping us make the kind of quick decisions uh, you have to make so it's you know it's a it's a mode you, you know we're in a mode of uh, you know don't you know communicate immediately with with uh, with family and residents if there's a change in the situation and keep them in the loop and we're also in the mode of just you know communication daily you know on a level that frankly was probably communication every other week or monthly or whatever i mean it's sort of it's you know it's all about um, managing through the disease process but we're in absolute constant communication yeah, no, the world's definitely changed in terms of its uh, velocity. <laughs> things that we, use, yeah. I mean, for Nick, things that we used to be doing on a quarterly basis, we're doing monthly or weekly basis. So it's everything's sped up quite a bit here. Literally, so, all this data, all this data, we update daily. I okay. Mean, and, and okay. So, all right. So so much for our weekly. You're doing daily. <laughs> all right. So um, Chris, let me ask you a little bit. Um, how busy are you in terms of, of lending or what's 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 going on now? Are you are you looking at deals? Are you looking at recaps? Are you looking at refinancings, development deals? What's happening in in your world right now? You know, I think our first priority right now, Beth, is dealing with the relationships we have, you know, the customers that we have, and that's right now dealing with the portfolio challenges or questions at least that are coming up at this point. We are still open for business. Uh, candidly, as you and Steve and I talked about last week. We're just not seeing a huge amount of deal activity right now. I think, you know, as weeks and months go by and people kind of conclude what the new normal is and where it's time to look at opportunities, I think we'll see more of that. But frankly, deal activity has been relatively low. Hey, Steve, what what's going on in, in um, uh, PGM in terms of like investment committee or questions that you're getting asked by your investors and how you're responding to that and to sort of the people that you report into? Sure. I think I would echo what Chris said, that there's largely been just a big pause right now. And I think it's important to note that our company is very global in nature. Um, in fact, uh, given where we are right now, a lot of our decision making has been elevated to a global decision making committee. Uh, our head of Europe actually is from Italy. And so they've been one of the hardest uh, hit countries. And our CEO's brother is actually an epidemiologist. So you know, they have obviously very strong opinions about where we are. So I think our, our company has really taken an approach of, of pause and wait and see, try to get more information for the deals that we do have, particularly on developments. We're trying to, frankly, take some more time until we get better visibility, just in terms of where the economic recovery is going to be, how long it's going to take, what's going to happen to labor costs, what's going to happen to construction costs and, and things like that. So we've extended some land deposits and, and things like that. On the acquisition side, we still very much like the pipeline we had. We actually had a very substantial pipeline prior to COVID-19, and we still have that, but it's really on ice right now. So, you know, it's really difficult to pursue an acquisition of some size when you can't even walk a building or tour it. You can't get anybody to come into the building to inspect it. You can't get your license because a lot of the government offices are shut down. And so it becomes very challenging uh, to really proceed on an acquisition. On the other side, the capital markets, obviously there's a lack of clarity. There's, there's very little pricing discovery right now, and we're seeing a very significant bid-ask spread on, uh, on various deals. So, and I think the mindset is, generally speaking for senior housing, it's still very optimistic. Right? We still think senior housing has a very bright future. Uh, we're conscious of where we are in the cycle and that we need to be making decisions for the medium and long term. But obviously the immediate conditions and the current situation have to impact the decision making. So I think it's a mix of all those factors. So what about headline risk? You know, every day I live in Boston, every day there's a front line, a front page story about something going on and, and related to COVID and then related to the skilled nursing or senior housing. So what do you what do you say when you ask that question by your investment committees? Sure. And I know there might be some mixed feelings about the statement on the NIC uh, call like this, but we've really tried to differentiate senior housing from skilled nursing. And I think that's been a bit of a misconception. There have been a lot of articles in the Wall Street Journal and other publications, for example, lately that do conflate the two. Uh, we think that is generally inaccurate and we do try to combat that where we can. Now, obviously, they do face similar challenges. So um, but you're absolutely right. We've seen pressure. We've seen a lot of questions from our investors. Frankly, some of our investors and our funds are also afraid of headline risk. And so uh, we've been very comfortable uh, with their support and, and we've been, I think, very good about 
uh, sheltering them for lack of a better term. But you know, I think the reputational aspect is really you know, the big focus going forward. We've been communicating with NIC also with Asha and Argentum and trying to be a little bit more proactive perhaps on some of the, uh, on some of the communication and media uh, approaches to combating that. So I think you're starting to see some of that gain some momentum. I think you'll see that uh, grow going forward. But absolutely, that's been an impact there. And I, I think it's it's clarifying the, the different product types, the impact, and, and clarifying some of the data. And just one more point, Beth, I think one of the things that you and I have talked about is I'm very concerned about the data that's going to come out of this. When you have seniors that are 95 years old, they have multiple conditions. Uh, and for you know, an, an unfortunate situation, they do pass away. And then they're tested positive for a condition later on, the COVID-19 condition. I think we have a lot of very blurry data right now. It's going to be very difficult to really dig through that and determine what the real you know, success rate or, or failure rate was uh, for performance. Yeah, we're, we're definitely aware of that as well. I mean, Nick's um, been working hard to try to make sure that you know, that the, when we talk to the media, that there's a real understanding that, you know, we need the PPE, we need the testing for the frontline workers, especially to try to prevent it from moving into properties themselves. So, you know, if you want to like flatten the curve, you really need to flatten the curve in, in senior housing and skilled nursing as well by having the proper equipment and proper approaches to that. Um, so it's definitely been something that we've been focusing in on. Chris, how about um, you? I mean, you you all at Capital One have been investing in seniors housing for a long time. Um, are you nervous at all in your um, organization in terms of the the newspaper headlines that we're seeing and the headline risk? I mean, I think that people are obviously aware of it. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I, I'm I'm not sure what the genesis or the basis for a lot of what I perceive as very negative press for about our space is about. I think one of the things I've been really, really impressed with is how we, as an industry, have kind of circled the wagons together. And it starts with Nick and Asha and Argentum, as Steve kind of indicated. You've got Scott Stewart and others starting more of a grassroots effort, just trying to change the messaging out there and the perception. And I think that on the other side of this, and, and a lot of this has to do with the data that Steve indicated, I think we have a huge opportunity as an industry to really show how we differentiated ourselves versus the general population and taking care of the seniors and the people that we represent. But no, people within Capital One are concerned. And look, obviously you have to chain. They're not involved in this day to day. They rely upon my team and others to convey information. And, you know, fortunately we have a lot of great operators and, and owners that are, that are on top of this. Um, are you anticipating uh, uh, your write downs or are you anticipating a round of recapitalizations like we saw in the last recession in 08, 09, or how are you preparing for the future? I, I hope not. I'm way too old to go through that again, Beth. I can <laughs> tell you that. Look, it's, we're way too soon. It's interesting, you know, when all this started, you go back to the Nick conference in San Diego in February, which I kind of look at the, the baseline, you know, there was some talk about how the conference was going to proceed. There were a lot of people debating whether they were going to go on no travel and things like that. And it's kind of progressed from that. There were a lot of people that thought, oh, senior housing is going to be the first area to hit. There's, you know, the bottom's going to drop out. And none of that to this point has really played out. So, um, you know, it's way too early to talk about whether we're going to have challenges in terms of our portfolio to that level. What we try to communicate with people is, look, we've been in this space for a long time. We understand there's ups and downs. Uh, we're here to support you to the extent that there are challenges down the road. We'll try to work together to resolve those. Okay, Steve, how about you? What are you are you looking at um, when you look at your crystal ball in terms of valuations or pricing? We're getting a lot of questions about that from our audience. Um, what, what's your view on that? So I'm a believer in the self-fulfilling prophecy here that if we keep talking about cap rates going up and we talk about uh, the impact of, or the erosion of capital markets and it's going to happen eventually because people start believing what they hear. Um, that said, obviously the fundamentals are changing. We are seeing obviously pressure on margin and operating expenditures. I think in, in time we'll see you know, improvement in terms of the labor market, which has really been pressuring the industry for, for many years. But to answer your question more directly, I do think there'll be probably six to 12 months of pain in terms of cap rates. Uh, we think that that may provide some opportunity for us in terms of buying as long-term investors and, and holders. Um, but I think as you look into 2021 and beyond, I still think you're going to go back to, you know, perhaps where we were in the current environment where, you know, a class A cap rate might have been five to six percent. I still think it'll be there in a couple of years. You still have the demographic wave coming. That's not going to change. Uh, I still think you're going to have strong investor interest in the space. 
And I still think you're going to see a lot of searching for yield in the capital markets and from institutional investors. So I don't think that's going to change. We've even had discussions internally within PGM at a very senior level about potentially because of interest rates going down, cap rates going down. And so I think as we get past some disruption and some volatility, I still think uh, we don't really know what's going to happen, but I think there's a, a very wide range of what could actually happen. But um, Do you think I, your I think underwriting so. assumptions are going to change in terms of exit cap rates, um, rent growth? Um, how's your underwriting? We probably haven't really done very much right now because there's not a lot of deals, but what do you anticipate? Once yeah, that's that, that's a great that's a good point, Beth. We haven't really done a whole lot on the capital market side, but where we have spent a lot of time is looking at rent growth and revenue growth assumptions, as well as operating growth assumptions. And so we've really uh, hit the, uh, the, uh, the the revenue side, you know, fairly uh, significantly. That said, we are using the GFC as really a bit of a benchmark. And so, you know, I still think we're going to see, generally speaking, positive rate growth. You know, maybe not as as frothy or healthy as it was for the last ten years but I don't think it's going to really go that low. Uh, and then I still think they're going to see a rebound into 2021, as I said. So, so that's where we're spending a lot of time uh, as well as on lease up pace in, in terms of our, our uh, underwriting assumptions. We're pushing all of our lease ups out. We just expect that we're not going to have really any positive movements for 2020 and maybe into third or fourth quarter, we might start to see some, uh, but we are forecasting net erosion of occupancy with, you know, flattish to negative uh, rent growth and then a more positive outlook in 2021. Okay, great. John, how about you? Um, as the operator, what, what's your crystal ball telling you? And, and I have a lot of questions actually that we got ahead of this in terms of development. Is there development going on? Are you still planning development? So sort of what's your acquisition or what's your current portfolio and then your development portfolio? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, well, in the, not, not necessarily in that order. It's um, the two big projects were involved uh, with in, in partnership uh, with related in New York and, and related in and Well Tower in New York and uh, San Francisco are underway. I mean, we we were related was able to get uh, um, essential services waivers and construction hasn't hasn't stopped. Those are those are buildings that are aimed at 2022, and we still feel very very good about that. Um, we are uh, probably going to op open a building. Um, in in uh, the Philadelphia market in the next three weeks or so. So one of the things it's it'll be a bit of an experiment. One of the things that maybe you talk about testing. Um, we will finish on 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 Saturday testing all 14,000 of our U.S. employees. We started wow. uh, seven or eight days ago, and we were able to get testing and lab services from uh, from Mayo Clinic laboratories. Um, and and that, you know, our our strategy of protecting the community from the outside with testing for for uh, you know for employees um, and and test and, and and quarantine and PPE to protect residents internally um, is what we've been is is our is our way forward in in, in this environment. The building in Philadelphia, we're going to open. You know, we're going to have all staff freshly tested. We're going to test all residents on the way in. Um, we're, we'll test all new hires, and we may have periodic retesting. So we're going to offer. We, you know, you can't make promises that it's COVID-free, but we're going to offer, um, you know, a new building that um, will, in, over the next three or four months, have access to enough testing um, that you'll know exactly what's going on if you're part of that. So, you, you know, perhaps as testing opens up and testing becomes available, the issue with testing is not that it's expensive; it's just the availability. Um, and as testing opens up. I mean, you could, you could, that could be a breakthrough, um, you know, for, for, uh, you know, for senior housing and, 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 uh, you know, a new growth. Um, so our it, surveys you know, are showing a slowdown in move-in rates. Are you, are you starting to reopen in terms of move-ins for existing properties? What's, what's your strategy on move-ins yes. right now? Yes. I mean, our, our strategy is, um, you know, it's, and we're, it's test employees, um, you know, and if you, you find positives there, Sitting out for a period of time, um, uh, we've tested agency staff alongside our employees, so we make sure, you know, that we can we can we can operate, um, and you know, then we allow move-ins, uh, a limited number of move-ins, um, and all move-ins, no matter whether you've been tested or not, you're treated, um, you're 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 served with full PPE um, in the same 
quarantine that everyone is for for uh, you know for a period of time until you've shown to be symptom free. Um, we're also you know one of the things that you know it's didn't talk about technology, but technology I think is becoming a, a bigger deal for for everybody, not just in communicating. Um, we're about to roll out an app for family members, so they'll be able to see you know what their mom's or dad's temperatures were on our daily temp checks. So, you know, one of, one of the things you have to, when you say you're gonna test staff and you're not gonna test residents, there's there's clear reason to do that, um, but you need an answer. And the, you know, the answer is, if you're, if, you're, if you're asymptomatic and you're in quarantine, all medical professionals are gonna tell you to do is keep you in quarantine and, and watch for symptoms. So, um, so are you so using telehealth? That. Are you using telehealth more or some? Yeah, or absolutely. So, so it's there are uh, hospitals that are aggressively opening up their telehealth networks. So we uh, made a deal with Northwell on Long Island. Uh, Northwell, biggest uh, hospital system on Long Island, and they are urgent care telehealth in 60 of our communities, not just our New York area communities, but all up and down the eastern seaboard. Working on a couple other deals across the country, um, and also trying to we we put the tools inside communities to allow for telehealth and you know are getting to the point where we can also start to require local PCPs to 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 you know we're, we're, I mean it's the, the the disease transmits the way it transmits and we've we've had a handful of cases where it's clear um, you know that it's and healthcare professionals have done a, have done amazing thing in this world um, you know but it's also you know they're around the disease and so um, you know that's a clear using telehealth to to keep our uh, you know residents uh, less exposed to the outside world is is really important and so telehealth is both uh, relationships for urgent care uh, to keep residents perhaps um, you know out of the ambulance and out of the emergency room um, but also making facilitating you know residents using their relationship with their existing doctors to 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 get to get some, the support they need. Okay, so let me ask um, Chris, starting with you. So telehealth is one of the changes that may be coming as a result of the COVID and the sort of the post-COVID world telehealth. Do you see any other changes that you think might be permanent from your observations in terms of what might stick? So any technology or building designs or anything else that you sort of getting a, a sense of right now ahead of the end of the COVID? I don't know that there necessarily are back. I mean, again, it's it's hard to prepare prepare for any possible situation. I mean, who would have ever guessed something like this would happen? Um, I do think that we will continue, you know, as Nick has highlighted, we will continue to emphasize the relationship between senior housing care providers and the healthcare systems you know, that may be in their different areas. I think the other part of that, though, is there's another factor, I think, to what we do besides just healthcare, and that is a lifestyle for the seniors that I think a lot of studies have proven to be very beneficial in terms of the social aspects and tell in terms of the dietary things and all that. And I don't think we want to necessarily de-emphasize those because of the healthcare situations we're dealing with today. I don't know, John, I mean, John's closer to that than, than I am, but I, uh, that's my perception. From well, I think you're talking about like population health management and the idea, I and mean, there's been a study by Kaiser family that shows that, you know, where you live does in fact matter because of the environment in which you live or the ability to follow your prescriptions and the ability to have a better healthy lifestyle. And that's extending quality of life and extending life for a lot of uh, folks. John, did you have something you want to add on that? Yeah, a, a couple things. I, I would say that, um, you know, situations that have worked better, you know, we have, you know, a variety of communities because they were developed in all sorts of different ways. Um, you know, but the ones that have uh, slightly larger room sizes and kitchen, full kitchenettes bordering on kitchens, you know, it's 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 a you know it's an environment that obviously works better, um, you know, in this situation. From a culinary point of view, one of the things that um, you know we've been able to do is you know make deals with uh, you know the big food vendors to get more commissary prepared foods. It's sort of it, you know it it you know, coming out of this will be a way to tier food service in a thoughtful way, um, you know, high quality, still chef prepared, still, you know, from scratch, but, you know, using the commissaries that, 
you know, Cisco and uh, that Cisco has to support uh, restaurants um, and, and cutting down on labor, also assuring quality and consistency, you know, so from at the very top of, of the, you know, the, the, the Atria brands, full on restaurants, a la carte menus, you know, you know, chef driven, literally, you know, two at the lower price points, um, high quality, you know, but but done in a way, you know, that the cost of the cost of the, the cost of, of food is not the cost of food, it's the cost of the labor. So, you know, all sorts of efficiencies like that. Some other things that are going on, learning that you can, for example, take a, a med tech and a and a caregiver and create a universal care worker and how that helps with with staffing. So so there are a bunch of little things like that that I think are gonna make us a lot better coming out of this. And, and sort of create opportunities for efficiencies. And also, you know, there are things that, you know, the culinary transformation is something we've been thinking about um, for a while. This is gonna give a vehicle coming out of this, you know, for us to actually, you know, make some big changes that we think are value creating uh, long-term. That's great, that's good to hear actually. So um, it was already 11.47, so I don't have too much more time. So I want to give each of you a minute or two to sort of give some uh, final thoughts on where you think we are today with COVID and where we might be when we come out of that and any other observations you might want to share. So Steve, starting with you. Yeah, sure. Happy. I, I don't know why I have to go first because this is a question that nobody <laughs> has answered to. So everybody, has, everybody else is going to be able to uh, respond to my thoughts. Um, I, you know, I, I've been telling our investors, I think for the last couple of weeks, I think in, in late March and early April, I think we were still in the very early phase, the early part of the curve in terms of the COVID-19 impact. Uh, I think now we've advanced a little bit more. And as we talk to our partners in the industry, I think we're a little bit probably closer to the plateau. We're starting to see a little bit of a slowing of overall case, positive cases at communities and residents and staff. So I think we're a little bit further along there, generally speaking. That said, with internally, we talk about various forms of recovery. We talk about the V recovery, the bathtub recovery, the W recovery, the U recovery, uh, and there's just a lot of volatility. And actually, we're working on an investment committee memo right now where we have to show three different scenarios. So I still think we're in a huge period of uncertainty, Beth. I don't think anybody really knows where we're going to be. Um, I think it also ties into the broader economic uh, situation. And you know, do we end up in a prolonged uh, recession as we did during the GFC? Is it deeper but shorter? Uh, is the senior housing have the same uh, situation? And I think an important consideration there is where we are in supply and demand and demographics for senior housing. And so, you know, as I said, we're still pretty optimistic on the space as a whole. Uh, we were starting to see a downturn in, in unit starts, as, as you guys have reported uh, very well. And so I think, you know, as we look forward, I think the two to five year plan is, you know, is still pretty optimistic. Uh, I still think we're going to see continued turmoil uh, in terms of some of the community impact. I didn't get a chance to, to comment before. You know, we're very closely looking at the impact on margins. Well, what is the labor situation? What does the PPE situation look like going forward? Are margins totally different? So I think we have to really look at the overall underwriting of senior living communities in the longer term. Uh, I'm less worried about the short term capital markets and cap rate type impact and the demographics, as I said. Um, but there's certainly going to be some changes. And, you know, and my final point maybe was in the GFC, you saw a bit of uh, a differentiating performance between independent and assisted living. You know, in another case, smaller units outperform larger units. And you, sh you could start to see some impact from those macroeconomic trends and factors, you know, piling into senior housing. So I know that wasn't really a, a lot of conclusions or recommendations, Beth, but um, I think those are some of the things we think about for the future. That's great. And I actually appreciated your comment, especially about scenarios. Um, I, and then Nick Insider just got published this week. I wrote an article and I said that scenario planning, I think, is really important. You know, do your worst case and then ratchet it back up so you can see what the impact might be on your overall organization, on each of your properties to, to do that. And I think that's more important than ever to, to, to test it and to see um, how strong those properties can withstand uh, what types of pressures. No, I totally agree with you. And, and I'm very contrarian by nature. I actually do believe this is the time to be investing. And, and we're, we're fortunate that we just raised a, you know, an almost billion dollar fund and we sit with 90% of that capital remaining. So as we look at this type of environment, it's a very favorable environment for us to be in. Yeah. Um, okay, Chris, how about you? A few um, couple minutes to talk about what you sort of view as the overall outlook for the sector and any other observations you're making right now. 
it's kind of hard to follow Steve, but I, I echo a lot of what he's saying. Look, I think the fundamentals of the space are there, the demographic information that we've watched for the last decade or so. I really do believe that, that we are going to, as an industry, come out on the other side of this looking really, really, really good in terms of how we've cared for our residents and all that. And that's a again function of data as we've talked about. To Steve's point, I think you know the big concern is our macro issues, right? You know, if we end up having huge reduction in the value of residential real estate or things like that, or this is really a, a protracted situation just for job loss and unemployment and those kind of things, I think those will, will certainly impact the industry. But the fundamentals of the space are, I think, will continue to be strong. I think affordability will continue to be a challenge that we will deal with as an industry um, that may be exacerbated by what's going on right now. Okay, great. And John? Um, what's your take on um, sort of where we are, where we're going to be heading? Uh, I, th I think we're in the, you know, in the short term, you know, we're day to day um, still. Um, there's a um, one of the sites that everybody looks at that we look at, the smart guys at the University of Washington, there was a quote that says exiting early is like uh, opening. Uh, it's what's the quote? It's it's like opening your opening your parachute. Exiting early is like not wanting to open your parachute because you're afraid it's going at 2,000 feet because you're afraid it's going to slow you down or something like that. I don't know. I got it. you can look it up. It was a better quote. Yeah, I, I, I uh, but um, look, I think, I mean, we're working on, you know, it's it's you gotta come up with a strategy, you know, to make the business make sense, and so you know we're. Um, you know, optimistic that we're going to start to see, you know, a little bit of, of movement in, in move-ins, um, you know, in May, the combination of, a, of, of, of testing um, all the staff. We're also going to test all our life guidance residents, which are memory care product, um, because in memory care, um, it, it's very hard to quarantine. And so, you know, that we, we feel like can both put us in a position to protect staff and, you um, and staff and residents, but also cautiously on a sort of very careful basis, take new residents. Um, there is pent up demand in, you know, it's some of it doesn't, yeah, doesn't know that it's pent up yet. But I mean, if you'd look at the number of people that would have moved into senior housing over the last, yeah, you know, couple of months now, you know, there are a lot of people who haven't done it. There are people who are in, a, in the normal places coming out of rehab, so have nowhere to go. And as, states open up and get back to work you know some of the situations that have made it possible for people not to use senior housing are, 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 are going to unwind so we're trying to be smart about being ready for that you know what the recovery can look like i mean if 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 you remember you know the recovery in in uh, you know 2009 was pretty dramatic once it started to turn i mean i think it's uh, okay. it's it, I think Atria saw a low point of 82 and about now and a high of 89 at the end of the year. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. I mean, you just have to be cautious. Um, you have to worry, you have to be, remain vigilant to make sure you, you prevent, you know, new outbreaks. You have to be really, really cautious about what's going on. But, um, you know, I think there's some, they're, they're for sure, the, the long-term mat the long-term premise for senior housing is absolutely it, it it's it's indisputable um, okay so know, let me how, let me interrupt for a second so we, right. we have to open up for audience questions but real quick if everybody can pop back up so we can see you i'm gonna do a real quick lightning round so that means you get like 10 seconds for an answer so um economic recovery so steve you were talking about is it a u a w or a swish so if you had to choose one, is it going to be a prolonged recovery or what shape is it going to be? For senior housing, I'm a fan of the Nike swoosh recovery. Okay, Chris. I'll go with Steve. <laughs> John. I think the the senior housing, that makes sense to me, but I think the, the economy itself is going to is going to be a W. I mean, I can't imagine that you're not going to have liquidity issues um, that pop because of all this. So, okay. I totally agree with that. I, sorry, Chris. <laughs> All right, occupancy rates. According to the NICS data, the first quarter 2020 occupancy rate for senior housing was 88%. So a year from now, you don't have to be precise if you don't want to be, but either higher or lower than 88%, or if you want to give me a number, go for that. John. Uh, the overall industry lower. 
Okay. Uh, but, 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 in, but in clear recovery. Okay. Steve? Agreed. Slightly lower because I think we're going to drop like the new Nike swoosh and have a gradual recovery. Okay. Chris? 88. 88. Yeah, I can't <laughs> agree with I kind of agree with 88, but but it's you know it'll too late, John. I took it first. Okay. All right. All right. So Chuck, can, we I think you've been collecting some questions. Can you? Um, we don't have too much time, but maybe you can share a few of those. Certainly. Um, in this is really directed to John. John, in recognition of all the great data that you're sharing, um, what are the metrics you're going to be looking at to determine when it's appropriate to start? Well, air quotes relaxing some of the restrictions and start opening up activities and services and the opposite of that what metrics are you looking at to potentially uh, slow down any openings I mean we're looking at the the simplest of metrics which it, you know which include you know real per capita um, information about disease penetration you know the testing ratio you know I think it's something we stumbled onto we made up um, but it seems to be telling a story. Um, if you if you if you combine that with looking at sort of per capita penetration, that feels like it 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 tells you a lot. We've seen the disease want to have a big impact in California and fade. So we've seen how that data behaves. Um, and and so you know it's really looking at at a, at a combination of of it really really simple math, just looking at all the numbers. Okay. Um, and then for Steve and Chris, given the importance of testing, uh, to John's point, can you give us any insights as to um, the prevalence of all site testing across your respective portfolios? Is that norm or, or still an ex the exception? I'll let Chris go first. So I can get it wrong. I think it's the norm at this point, Chuck. I think the, the limitations are based upon testing materials rather than an intent to do that. I think everybody that we know is, is making every effort they can to test as many people as possible. I, I would agree with that. I think it's it's uh, inconsistent across the board. We work with a number of different operating partners, and I think they each have slightly different protocol, uh, dependent upon their uh, level of you know uh, COVID-19 impact as well as their level of care and and all that. So it, it's been very different. Um, obviously, the, the more testing, the better. That said, I think you're seeing a lot of false testing and a lot of bad data. So I sometimes I question really how valuable the testing data really is. Okay. So just let, let me come on the comment on that really quickly. So, so far, testing really has been reserved for people who are symptomatic. It, and, and it's, you know, again, we've had situations where, you know, doctors have group tested, say, a memory care unit. And it doesn't do you any good to know necessarily that somebody is asymptomatic and positive. Um, because we're watching symptoms, and and so it, it, anyway, the the te using testing to screen employees to make sure you're catching pockets of the disease that could be coming in is a new thing, and that's that's something that people are starting to talk about in terms of how you open up the economy. So I mean, I think that more of that's going to come, and 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 fewer people have actually tried that kind of process, but but the testing of residents it doesn't do you any good i mean you know who has symptoms and you're going to get you know, you're going to get healthcare support for 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 residents that have symptoms whether it's covid-19 or not so i, I, I think just to it, uh, interrupt for one second i think an important aspect is going to be the res or excuse me the staff member testing and i think that's if i think the staff members because they're working in some cases different jobs or they have their own family members or kids they're the ones we see many times bringing in the infection into the communities. And so I think the testing there and the protocols and, and managing their labor is going to be really the key to, to you know, success in eliminating this or control at least. I mean, absolutely. That's why we felt very lucky to, to stumble into the capacity that we did. Um, you know, and also, you know, you find exactly that story. It's it's. And ask you got to everybody's got to ask the question at the front door. You've got to know wh where else your staff goes. I mean, you know that that's a that's a big you know big hint to operators out there or capital partners. Ask your operators if they're making sure, you know, that they know exactly what else your staff does. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we'll leave it at there. Great discussion, uh, which we much appreciate. Nikki, if maybe we could take it to the final slide. 
Um, and we welcome our audience to join us for our next leadership huddle webinar, which will include a presentation of the Nick Blue Book, addressing five ways COVID-19 could affect se senior living. The web that webinar is scheduled for two weeks from today on Thursday, May 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern. To register for this event and uh, for ready access to a variety of pandemic-related market information free of charge, please visit the Nick COVID-19 Resource Center at nick.org. As Nick remains committed to continually improving these webinars, we very much welcome your candid feedback. You're encouraged to complete the survey you'll receive following the conclusion of this webinar. Within the next couple days, you'll receive an email with a link to download the presentation and view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Beth Mace, myself, and this morning's panelists, Steve Blaze-Juski, John Moore, and Chris Taylor, thank you for having joined us. Please stay safe, maintain your physical distance, but stay connected. This concludes today's webinar. Bye, everyone.